And now I am delighted to introduce the director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Jen Easterly. On her CISA leadership page, she's holding a Rubik's Cube. And rumor has it that Director Easterly could solve a Rubik's Cube behind her back, no less, before she was 12 and can still put it together in less than a minute. Maybe we will test her skills later. Director Easterly was not only a Rubik's Cube wizard by the time she was a teen, she was also already fully committed to serving her country. She applied early to West Point without seeing it in person, launching a public service career that has taken around the world and deep into cyberspace. Her more than 20 years in Army intelligence and cyber operations included tours of duty in Haiti, the Balkans, Iraq and Afghanistan, and two Bronze Stars. She stood up the Army's first cyber battalion, helped design your cyber command, and served as deputy for counterterrorism at the National Security Agency. Tours at the White House under two very different leaders, Barack Obama and Condoleezza Rice, demonstrate the nonpartisan and urgent nature of her work. She was the head of Firm Resilience and Morgan Stanley when President Biden nominated her to lead CISA in spring of 2021. Since her unanimous Senate confirmation that summer, she has become not only a spokesperson for the idea that no business or critical infrastructure is immune from cyber threats, but also a bit of an icon, demonstrating that an electric guitar playing parent can also lead the effort to take down global cyber threats. I'm delighted to introduce Director Easterly to give remarks, which will be followed by a chat with Nilo Razi Hov, the senior operating partner of Energy Impact Partners, who returns after leading yesterday's riveting panel on misinformation. Welcome, Director Isteli and Nilo. Thank you. Great introduction. So for those of you who don't want to watch Rebel Without a Cause, but want to learn about chicken theory, you can also watch Footloose, I recommend. <laughs> so two weeks ago in Vancouver, OpenAI co-founder Greg Brockman took to the stage at TED to tell the inside story of ChatGPT. He talked about the current use of the technology, he talked about its future potential, and he demonstrated how ChatGPT could be used to solve the perennial problem that plagues all of us. What to make for dinner. So in his talk, Brockman asked ChatGPT to suggest a nice post-TED Talk meal and to draw a picture of it. And the audience watched in amazement as ChatGPT delivered a full menu, a very tasty looking AI gem generated image, and even a shopping list that it sent to Instacart via ChatGPT plugin. Here's Brockman's tweet that captures it all, an instant dinner party, courtesy of chat GPT. Pretty impressive, right? So I suspect that most in the audience watching Brockman's presentation were struck with a little bit of hunger. Now, I was struck with a different emotion, frankly, a darker emotion, one that reminded me of a recipe from many years ago. Now, in 2011, I came back from a deployment in Afghanistan. I retired from the Army, and I became the deputy director, deputy for counterterrorism at the National Security Agency, working with Darby over there. Uh, about a year earlier, Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Yemen, known as AQAP, published the first edition of its English language magazine known as Inspire. Now, for those of you who remember, AQAP was the same group who trained and deployed 23-year-old Nigerian Umar Farouk Abdelmutalab to blow up Northwest Airlines Flight 253 traveling from Amsterdam to Detroit on Christmas Day in 2009. And true to form, true to form, Inspire magazine was all about inciting lone wolf terrorists around the world to take up arms against the West. And it included a recipe, a recipe of how to make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom, essentially a how-to guide to build explosives 
using everyday ingredients that you can find in the pantry. Now, fearful that this material would be used to incite violence, Western governments reportedly scrambled to try and minimize the spread of the material, but ultimately, it got out. Now, it would garner international attention some three years later when it was revealed that Joe Karzarnaev and his brother Tamerlan would use that same recipe, how to make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom, to develop the explosives, those pressure cooker bombs, that they would leave at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. That recipe was used to take the lives of three people, including eight-year-old Martin Richard, and to wound over 260 others. Now imagine a world in the not-too-distant future where how-to guides, AI-generated imagery, auto-generated shopping lists are available for terrorists and for criminals, providing the capability to develop things like cyber weapons, chemical weapons, bioweapons, readily. Sounds pretty scary, right? And that's not even the worst case scenario. There are AI experts who've been studying this for decades, like Eliezer Yudkowsky, who have talked about the developments that we're seeing now in artificial intelligence leading to the destruction of humanity. So whether you're a, ta a tech catastrophist or a tech optimist or a tech pessimist or a tech realist like me, I want to talk today about how we can and really how we must use the development and implementation of AI to break the decades-long vicious cycle of technological innovation at the expense of security before our failure to do so breaks us as a society. And I want to talk a little bit about the last four decades, because I think it's an instructive history of security and safety being forced to take a back seat to speed to market and features. Now, when the internet was born, 1983, 40 years ago, when the TCP IP protocol was implemented to allow computers to communicate widely, security was not even a remote consideration. As the late pioneer security researcher Dan Kaminsky said, the internet was never designed to be secure. The internet was designed to move pictures of cats. It's very good at moving pictures of cats. And then a few years later, we saw the same thing with the mass adoption of software, with companies racing to get their products out, prioritizing features and speed to market over security. So products were released to market with dozens, hundreds, even thousands of flaws. And what happened was, is we had to develop an entire cybersecurity industry to deal with the vulnerabilities from the internet and software, a multi-billion dollar cybersecurity industry. And to add to that perspective, the Consortium for Information and Software Quality estimates that in 2022, the cost of poor software quality from cyber attacks due to vulnerabilities, complex uh, issues involving sup sub uh, software supply chain, the growing impact of rapidly accumulating tech debt, the cost of that was estimated to be $2.41 trillion in 2022. And then came social media, where leaders embraced the move fast, break things culture, right? And with that, we could move not just pictures, but videos of cats all over the world simultaneously to our friends. Yay! But at what cost? Well, according to Jonathan Haidt, who's a social psychologist at NYU Stern School of Business, one cost is the health of our children. He notes research that when social media came in, the mental health of our children plummeted, especially girls. And that's not all. We know that our foreign adversaries are using these capabilities and these platforms for influence operations, for disinformation, to undermine the very fabric of our democracy. We've seen it with the Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese, who actually refer to it in their doctrine as cognitive domain operations. Now, so far, the cost 
that we've paid for speed over security is pretty steep, but not existential. Now, AI, AI is different. AI is different, and our approach to AI has to be different. The explosion of large language models are proceeding three times faster than Moore's Law, doubling every six months as opposed to every 18 months, which is what we see with semiconductor size and speed. And while Greg Brockman says that OpenAI is not currently training the next iteration of ChatGPT, reportedly OpenAI has already acquired the processors and sourced the massive amount of energy required to start training the next iteration, ChatGPT5, this September, mean, meaning it will roll out a year from, from now, from September, so just before the 2024 presidential election. AI will be the most powerful capability of our time, and I believe it will also be the most powerful weapon of our time. And we cannot afford to same, make the same mistakes with this epoch-defining technology that we've made with the internet and with software and with social media. But yet, following the release of ChatGPT, the first version late last year, we saw a gold rush, an AI gold rush, where companies, again, race to integrate AI into their products, prioritizing speed, very little thought given to the downside. And, you know, after all, they're driven by competition, competition between corporations, which you know, at the end of the day, they are fiduciarily responsible for maximizing profits. Now look, let's just stipulate. Let's stipulate. Products with AI will bring incredible benefits. They will do amazing things. They really will. AI will make our lives better, and it will make our lives easier. But that's not the only thing they'll do. They will make lives better and easier for our adversaries, large and small, to inflict harms on us that we can only imagine today. While one person will use this technology to plan an extravagant dinner party, another person will use the capability to plan a cyber attack or a terror attack or to deploy shockingly realistic deep fakes. It's no small thing that Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, known as the father, the godfather of AI, just actually left his job at Google because he wanted to speak freely about AI risk. He just gave an interview to the New York Times that was published just this past Monday where he said that it's hard to see how you can prevent bad actors from using it to do bad things. And he specifically talked about his immediate concerns being that the internet would be flooded, probably even more than it already is, with fake videos, text, and images so that the average person really couldn't tell what was true anymore. I share his concerns. Now, the good news is people much smarter on this than me, people like Dr. Hinton, are sounding the alarm very loudly about the need for governments and industry and academia and research community to come together to ensure that we have the guardrails in place, the policy, the regulatory framework to prevent these increasingly powerful capabilities from being misused for destructive purposes. Just yesterday, we saw the vice president and senior White House officials meet with industry leaders to talk about AI risk, what we can do to mitigate it, how we can work together, how we must work together to ensure that the American people can benefit from advances in AI but be protected from its harms. Now, the bad news is we really don't have a lot of time. This is moving so fast. So the choices that we make today, the decisions that we make today, will really define the future that our children and our children's children inherit. We've got to get this right. We've got to get it right together. As the Chancellor just said, the stakes are too high. Thanks.
take it down. That was a good image. Yeah. Does anyone recognize where the image is from? Jen, thank you so much um, for this terrifying talk <laughs> on a Friday morning. Um, it, it, it reminds me, in 2011, Mark Andreessen famously said, software is eating the world. And as I listen to your talk, I think the 2023 version of that is AI is going to eat the world. Um, what do you say to people who don't share this, can I call it apocalyptic vision um, of AI, or alternatively believe that if we don't move fast and break things, we simply won't be able to keep up with China from a strategic competition yeah. perspective. Yeah, I mean, first of all, when I think about software as eating the world, I think about us getting food poisoning, quite <laughs> frankly, when you think about some of the secure by design points that we're making. So I, I worry about people making that blunt force argument about if we don't move fast, China will win. Um, and I think it's a little bit of fear mongering going on there, and I think it's, um, not helpful because at the end of the day, we all realize you're an, you're an entrepreneur, you know, you're a VC person. Uh, at the end of the day, innovation is what fuels the American economy. We've gotten so much out of it. But we have also allowed ourselves to kind of genuflect to the god of innovation without being that thoughtful. And that's what the whole talk was about on safety and security. And so I, I firmly believe we need to think about the benefits and the capabilities of these technologies, but we really do need to think about the very wide range of, of risks. And you know, you say apocalyptic, but at the end of the day, nobody likes to talk about this stuff, right? I mean, they wanna talk about innovation and entrepreneurship, that's fun, it's awesome here in Music City. Like, risks is a downer. But you know, I've spent my career, as you know, doing CT and doing cyber, and this is really about how do we manage these very difficult risks. So. When you look at China, China is actually putting very strict regulation in place. They are putting constraints on how the data is used, how the data is trained, on the content to ensure that it aligns with socialist core values. We need to ensure that we are building this technology to ensure it aligns with our democratic values. And the good news is the foundational research and the companies who are developing this are in the United States. So we have an opportunity to govern AI in a way that embeds democratic values in its use and in its deployment. And I think it's our responsibility, I know as Vice President Harris said yesterday, it's our responsibility to do so. How do you practically um, balance this challenge of uh, making sure we don't lose our technology um, and innovation edge, um, even as we drive towards supremacy, but also put on the appropriate guardrails um, to protect society from the, from the downside and the risk. Yeah. So, you know, guardrails, policy, there's the AI Bill of Rights that's gone out, there's the AI Risk Management Framework that was released by the National Institute for Standards and Technology earlier this year. And then, you know, there's a lot of talk about regulation. You know, I think um, Sundar Pichai actually said he thinks it needs to be regulated. I know the Congress is starting to talk about that. You know, regulation can be perceived as kind of a dirty word. But at the end of the day, I think there is a place for smart use of regulation. Now, I'm not a regulator, but I came from an industry that was highly regulated in finance. And so I think that there are ways to use regulation to actually spur innovation, quite frankly, when you think about emission standards inspiring electric vehicles. So I think we need, to ha we need not to be fearful to have these conversations. I think it's incredibly important that we recognize it's not either innovation or safety security. And that's kind of the way we've looked at it. That's why we've had to bolt everything on. Now, given that CISA is not a regulatory agency, which, which is an advantage in many ways in terms of interacting with the private 100%. sector. 100%. Pardon? 100%. 100%, yes. great. Um, what is CISA doing specifically? Um, to address these concerns. Yeah, thanks for the question. So I, I'm really pleased to see the administration is moving out on this. Um, last week, Secretary Mayorkas announced a DHS task force focused on AI, and we're of course playing a role in that, but we're doing three things. So first, we are continuing to figure out how we can use AI in our core mission of cyber defense. So we've been working actually for years on AI and ML and how to detect Threats. I'm also really captured by this idea of how we can use large language models for code <coughs> review. 
and maybe how we can use AI-powered translation tools to translate code into memory-safe language. You know, that's one of my obsessions. Uh, the second thing is, um, how can we protect AI, which I think is really important. We've been doing a lot of work with our great partners and friends across the federal government, NSA and, and FBI and international partners on principles for security by design, security by default, how to secure technology, how to secure open source. As you know, because you're on our advisory board, we're going to look to, to um, leverage the great minds of our board to figure out how we can make those products extensible in AI and also how we can help some of the smaller, not very well resourced companies who are building AI to protect that. So in the same way that we work with small businesses to help them raise their security baseline. And then finally, you know, figuring out like AI is a threat vector. And among other things we're using, we have very unique convening powers to bring together the public sector and the private sector to have these discussions about AI risks and how we mitigate them. You know, the last thing I'd say is all of this is about the talent, right? So I love coming to places like Vandy uh, to talk to the talent, right? The researchers and the, the students who are really gonna inherit all of this. And so people, and you know, we've been hiring some super people over the past couple of years and we're looking for great talent who work at the nexus of cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. So if there's folks out there, if there's students wanna think about joining Team CISA, come talk to me. Last week at the RSA converse, uh, conference at the Innovation Sandbox, the winner was a company, Hidden Layers, that protects AIML models from adversarial activity. The runner-up, Pangea, was a company that basically automates secure coding. Um, there's a lot that the government can do and government agencies can do with regulation. Clearly, you're also inspiring the innovation community um, to take a leadership role here. How much of the solution do you think will come from the private sector versus um, government? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, the government can't do it all, the private sector can't do it all. We have to work together. I mean, that is the core underlying principle of everything that we've been trying to do at CISA over the past couple of years, or really since, um, since the agency was created and, and founded by Chris Krebs. It's all about this whole idea of collaboration, right? And we've been talking about this, everybody in this audience knows, we've been talking about public-private partnership for decades. And in my view, it become kind of hackneyed, a meaningless term. But what we're trying to do is figure out how we can transform that into persistent operational collaboration. I've stolen a term from my good friend, Paul Nakasone, persistent engagement. So persistent collaboration, the flip side of that is, you know, work across the federal government, CISA, NSA, FBI, Cybercom, working with industry, working with international partners, working with state and local partners with a, with a mindset of a default to share, right? A default to share with a, a recognition that a threat to one is a threat to all in our highly connected, highly vulnerable world with a recognition that we are co-equal partners, industry and government together, working together with reciprocal expectations of transparency and value added and responsiveness. And, and where industry does not have to fear punitive sanction. And finally, to make it as frictionless as possible. So you have shared platforms for, uh, for data and analytics. So you can actually create this tapestry of, of visibility, this picture that you're seeing. So together, we can drive down the risk. So, you, you know, I am not a pessimist. I'm a realist on this. I used to be an optimist, and then the chat GPT thing happened. But um, so, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a huge believer. It, you know, Napoleon said, a, a leader is a dealer in hope. You cannot be a leader without being hopeful. And part of my hopefulness is just the incredible things that I, ever, I see every day, not just from our people, but <coughs> from private sector entrepreneurs and the innovation that fuels you know, the, the evolution of our, of our power. Um, it's interesting, the Italian Marxist philosopher, um, Antonio uh, Gramsci wrote from jail once, I'm an optimist, I'm a pessimist because of intellect, I'm an optimist because of will. <laughs> And despite the fact that he's a Marxist philosopher, can I, I just think say this a... is this is one reason why I love Nilu, because she's going to pull out some guy in jail named you know Gramsci from Brilliant, Brilliant. Thank you. Um, you uh, CISA put out a set of principles around secure by design, secure by default. Um, a lot of uh, the move towards secure by design and secure by default requires burden shifting yep. of the risk. 
Can you talk a little bit about that and why that would not affect innovation and entrepreneurship, but is actually uh, a way to make sure that it happens responsibly? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think this is one of the most important things that we are doing. We started this last year, this idea of how to ensure technology product safety. Because we've normalized this idea that technology, it's okay for technology to come off the assembly line full of vulnerabilities, and then we bolt on security, and everybody has to be in the constant patch cycle. And so this is hugely important. And I've been increasingly encouraged. You know, we put out that article in Foreign Affairs, Eric Goldstein and me, and I spoke at Carnegie Mellon. And we have received such fantastic response uh, from the private sector, as well as academia and research. And we published that product. And that wasn't a CISA product. That was a product with seals from NSA, from FBI, and from six of our international partners, the Five Eyes, the Dutch, and the Germans. Incredibly encouraging. And it laid out, you know, this was the initial sort of here principles for secure by design, how to reduce the number of vulnerabilities when you test and deploy software, and then secure by default. What are those security features like MFA that need to be baked in? And we did listening sessions at RSA that were fantastic. The industry you know, really wants to do this at the end of the day. I just got notes from Microsoft yesterday from Google, and they're energized around it. Look, technology producers, they want to create safe products. <laughs> they right. do. And consumers want safe products as well, but the, the incentives have always been misaligned, right? And so there has not been a clear market signal where uh, producers know exactly what we want and where consumers know what to ask for. And that's what's behind the principles, is starting to have that conversation about that clear market signal. And so I think, you know, at the end of the day, it is important to shift the burden off of the poorest communities and off of small businesses and off of individuals to those most able to bear it. But with respect to slowing down, or, or one of the concerns that came up at a hearing I did last week is, well, that, that's just going to mean that things are much more expensive and poor people, poor communities can't take advantage of them. But I mean, the truth is that the, the, the most uh, useful things to bake in, like MFA and password complexity, or go passwordless, right, with Google's announcement, they're not expensive for the producer. And you know, at the end of the day, all of these attacks that we're seeing, Dallas police and everything that's out there publicly about you know, small businesses and hospitals and K through 12, you, they should not bear this burden, right? So you can have innovation um, and it doesn't have to be at the expense of safety and security. So shifting for a second, um, just to make sure we cover this topic, um, you talked about China's use of technology and influence operations that you referred to as cognitive domain operations. You serve, they refer to it. They refer to it, sorry, yes. Um, you serve as a sector risk management agency for election infrastructure. Um, can, can you talk about the challenge to the upcoming presidential election and specifically what are we doing to make sure that that election um, goes well? Yeah. So really, really important, right? Sector risk management agency. So you know, the federal government does not run elections. It's all run by state and local. We work with them to ensure that they have the capabilities, the intel, the information, the resources to be able to secure their infrastructure from the full range of threats. And it's an incredibly complicated landscape now. It's not just cyber threats that we were early on worried about after the 2016 election. It's insider threats, it's physical threats. Frankly, that's what I was most worried about in 2022, that there would be an active shooter situation at a polling place. And then threats of disinformation. You know, I travel across the country and I speak to secretaries of state, chief election officials, state election directors, and almost universally, and it doesn't matter, this is not a partisan issue. From all of them, I hear their concerns about disinformation. And, you know, I pointed out some of these capabilities, and I think Chris talked about it yesterday will exacerbate that situation. So what are we doing? We actually, um, starting early this year, we work with secretaries of state and state election directors to put out a roadmap of all of the type of capabilities that we provide, both physical, cyber, insider threat, the services across the country. We have an election mission manager, Jeff Hale, who is gonna lead our cross-agency effort on this. And then what we're looking to do is to ensure that these capabilities can be available down to the local level. Right? I mean, at the state level, they're actually pretty good. They've made enormous strides on cyber. 
But there are, I think, 8,000 uh, you know, uh, jurisdictions at the municipal, at the township, at the county level, and ensure that we can reach them to give them the capabilities that they can absorb and the capabilities that they can use to, uh, to be able to drive down risk. On, on disinformation and foreign influence operations in particular, we just do three pretty simple things. One, we work with our intelligence community partners to understand the tactics of foreign disinformation, and we put out uh, advisories on that. We did two with the FBI before the midterms um, and how to build resilience against that. We have a site called Rumor versus Reality, which is basically just election literacy. Elections are surprisingly complicated and technical. And so this is information on how elections work. And then finally, and most importantly, we amplify, we use our communications platforms to amplify the, the voices, the trusted voices of state and local election officials. And so uh, we are already working that hard, and that will be one of our very top priorities this year and, and next, of course. In the early days of CISA, there was some um, friction between state and local election yeah. uh, folks accepting help from yeah. the federal government. Is Chris out there? <laughs> has that changed? How has that changed? How has that evolved? Yeah, I mean, look, I always give credit to my great friend Chris Krebs on this. I think it was a pretty hostile environment when the designation was made of election infrastructure as, as critical infrastructure. And I think there was actually you know, a statement that was put out about, you know, we don't want your, your help. Right. Um, but again, you, you know, there is the healthy skepticism about the federal government at the state and local level. It's not, it's not unique to elections. Um, but you know, they, they really beat the pavement, um, Chris and his team and Matt Masterson, to develop those trusted partnerships, which frankly I inherited. And I'm not a political person, and CISA is not a political agency, so it's incredibly important that we develop trust and relationships. Trust is the coin of the realm in cybersecurity, as anybody will tell you. And so we inherited great relationships, and we have looked to continue to grow and strengthen those great relationships. So are you optimistic or pessimistic about our ability to protect the elections? I'm optimistic. Fantastic. I'm optimistic because look at 2022, and it, it wasn't us. I mean, this is off the back of the incredible work of state and local election officials. Now, some of them have left their job because of physical threats and because of concerns, so now we're working with the, the new cadre to train them. But, you know, if you're a military person, and there are a lot of current and former military person, you wear a uniform, everybody thanks you for your service, and it's, you know, very gracious. But, like, if you see a poll worker, if you see an election official, Thank them for their service, because it has been a very difficult time, and I suspect 24 will be as well. And they are out there working for very little pay on the front lines of our democracy. And they've been on the receiving end of a of lot of these threats. It's horrific. Are we able to protect them? Yeah, I mean, this, is, this comes down to local law enforcement. Um, but of course, FBI and the Department of Justice have a task force and have a role. Um, but you know, a lot of what we are doing from a building resilience perspective are things like how to do security assessments. We put out this training around the power of hello, how to engage people to try and lower the tensions. We have um, de-escalation de tra de training. So we are working, and you know, all of this is not just a CISA thing. We serve as the SRMA, but this is a federal government effort. We work very closely with NSA, uh, with Cybercom, and with uh, FBI on this. This is really a whole of government issue. So if we pull up just for a second, it's. It's about two years since Colonial Pipeline. And then there was sort of a series of events coming after that. How are we doing? How has cybersecurity evolved? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm very optimistic about this. And part of it is because, you know, solar winds and Colonial Pipeline, Microsoft Exchange, um, all of that really sort of raised the profile. And the administration has put a lot of effort. We've got terrific people across the board working on these. With respect to Colonial Pipeline in particular, a huge amount of work done on ransomware. Uh, I think the Institute for uh, Security and Technology, Phil Reiner and Megan Stiefel are having a great conference in DC to talk about this. Some of the work that they did ended up in legislation. I don't think we would have gotten CERCIA, the cyber incident reporting, without Colonial Pipeline. And uh, we're looking to put that into place uh, in the next couple years. And that will make a big difference to really understand the ransomware ecosystem. Also with CERCIA came the Joint Ransomware Task Force, which we co-lead with FBI, we just deployed a ransomware vulnerability warning pilot to help entities sign up for vulnerability scanning so they can see uh, where unpatched vulnerabilities that could allow for ransomware attacks. And one of the things I'm most excited about, these pre-ransomware <coughs> notification initiative, 
where we get tips from industry, from researchers, from threat intel about malware, ransomware being deployed but not yet activated. So there's hours to days when it's actually activated. And then we use our field force to go out and to warn. You know, some of them are big companies, some of them are very small, K through 12 and all of that, and then international partners. So it really is for, you know, I always, when I was a kid, I watched Saturday morning cartoons, it's like super friends. It really is like Hall of Justice versus Legion of Doom. Like, I love this. I have people like reaching out to me to talk about this. So that's exciting. Um, we've, we've also done, you know, whole of government ransomware, stopransomware.gov, but the other things uh, working with you know the JCDC, which I love, the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, which you know is the entity that Congress created because they wanted one platform to bring the federal cyber ecosystem together to face off to industry. So CISA, FBI, NSA, to allow us to communicate in real time what the threat is, share our insights, both with industry but also with international partners and with state and local so we could put that picture together and drive down risk and it's for planning, cyber defense planning and operations. We work with pipeline companies as well as ICS vendors to plan for the biggest threats to instantiate detection technology. I'm super excited about that. Uh, we've also uh, developed the CPGs, the Cybersecurity Performance Goals. I was just talking to a gentleman before this at Quinnip Quinnipiac who are using that for small businesses. That's awesome because it's an extract of the NIST cybersecurity framework, and that's what it's for. 38 things by cost, complexity, and impact that can drive down risk. And it's, so I think all of these together, it is making, it is making uh, progress you know, from Colonial Pipeline. The last, last thing I'd say is, look, one of the big lessons of Colonial Pipeline, and we see this in Ukraine, it's also a big lesson in Ukraine, is not just the importance of cyber resilience and functional resilience so you can recover and, and mitigate impact. It's, it's societal resilience. And the Chinese who are learning a lot from Ukraine and learning a lot what they're watching and our reactions, our reactions to Colonial Pipeline, our reactions to the high altitude balloon, they're looking at that and they're saying, ah, and this was in the IC annual assessment, you know, if we go after Taiwan, if we look to reunify, whether it's an invasion or a blockade of the Straits more likely, we are going to go after critical infrastructure to induce societal panic, to prevent military deployment. They're gonna go after pipeline, they're gonna go after rail. So one of the big lessons learned is we need to have societal resilience. Think back to the Brits, keep calm and carry on, or really modern day, think back to the Ukrainians. That's pretty amazing how they've been you know, attacked so mercilessly, a civilian, civilian infrastructure, and they are still fighting on to victory. Is that more of a mindset that we need to adopt? I think a lot of that is. I think a lot of it is. When you, there's all this incredible activity, right? Whole of government, international partners, private sector, public-private partnership that's happened that you just discussed. What are the key things we need to do differently as you look over the next 12 months to continue building on this resilience? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the thing, to get out of this cycle, I do think we're doing well, and that's off the back of our people and our partnerships. But to get out of the cycle, it's this idea of creating a sustainable approach to cybersecurity, and that's where we have to completely shift the paradigm. We have to create safe technology that drives down vulnerabilities. That's what the foundational principle is behind security by design and default. We have to continue with this persistent operational collaboration. And then we also need to look at, the other thing we talk about is corporate cyber responsibility where CEOs and boards need to embrace cyber risk and own cyber risk. It should not be the job of the CISOs and CIOs, right? We need CEOs to recognize their responsibility to drive down risk and that they own that. And so this corporate cyber responsibility, I think, will also make a big difference. So those are the three things that we are looking toward to continue to move the ball in a very positive way. Um, we're sadly going to be out of time soon. I feel like we could continue forever. So I want to end on a somewhat personal note. I know that uh, this is a personal topic that's important to you. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, um, and you are a big mental health advocate. And this week, we talked about this briefly yesterday, the U.S. Surgeon General came out with um, an advisory on the epidemic of loneliness and isolation uh, in the U.S. with some key pillars on how uh, we should think about addressing it. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing, what you're doing at CISA to address this issue? Yeah, thanks very much um, for the question. So, um, you know, I've talked about this publicly, but I lost my little brother to suicide 
about 20 years ago when he was 25. <coughs> and I didn't talk about it for a very long time. Most of my close friends didn't know about it. And then when I got to the private sector, I actually started talking about it more. And I found that talking about it, just people would come up to me and there would be the similar stories about their family members, about their friends. And at the end of the day, we're all going through things like this. And the pressures that we have personally and with our kids in the pandemic, of course, made this worse. And you know, in cyber, it's a very intense space and there's so much that's going on. And I found out initially when I got there and did sensing sessions and did office hours, people would talk about burnout. And so we really try to work hard to integrate into our culture the fact that mental health is health. And everybody uh, should have the resources and the grace and the empathy to be able to have conversations about this and be able to tap into people to talk to. You know, We made Headspace, the mindfulness app, available to, for free to all our employees. We set up meditation rooms. We brought in experts to talk about burnout. All these things, because I think at the end of the day, if you, you are not healthy, just not just physically, but mentally, you're not gonna be able to do your incredibly important job of defending the nation. And so, and, and I've seen these advances across the administration and other places, but I, I just think it's incredibly important that we all realize that nobody is alone. We are all there to have these conversations and to take care of each other. Uh, that's a great way to end the session. I really wanna thank you for everything that you're doing and, and for joining us today. Awesome, thank you so much.